Oh, there you are, Tally. I've been looking everywhere for you. What are you doing in Season of Discovery? Who knows, Evie? And that's the whole point, isn't it? Finally, we get to enjoy WoW without the spoilers, without the data mining, without all the guides and answers and hand-holding. Here, finally, is fresh WoW. Naked WoW. Awesome. Are you going to be a warlock tank? <laughs> Don't tell me what I can be, Evie. Don't spoil it. The whole point is discovery, okay? I'm discovering it. Is that what you did in phase one? I didn't play phase one because I was busy, but that just means I've got even more to discover now, doesn't it? It's like season of double discovery for me. Season of duo discovery. Sounds good. So what's the plan? I don't know. You know, that's the magic, isn't it? I can go anywhere, do anything. Thing, confident that adventure is just around the corner. You know, Wowhead has some really good guides on where all the rooms and stuff are. Yeah, can you send those to me? Yeah. Knowledge is power. Hello, Internet Taliesin here, and welcome to another episode of the Weekly Reset, Taliesin and Evertel's Wondrous Wisdom Show. In a week where it's it's been a while since the last week, actually, hasn't it? And that's not entirely our fault, because I, I don't like to make excuses, and I don't like to bang on about IRL problems, but in fairness, we've got a big hole in our house, which is why you never invite Sylvanas around for D&D, because before you know it, she's ripping up the crown of domination, and all shit breaks loose, so... Sorry, but I really wanted to make this episode, even if it's a little tiny little bit late, because there's one particular piece of news that I very much want to discuss. So, things that have happened <laughs> since our last episode. Season of Discovery Phase 2 is, of course, underway in all its Blood Moon PvPing, Gnome Regan raiding glory. Love is in the air with its all new quest lines focused on self love, which actually, you know, I thought I didn't really care about WoW holidays, especially Love is in the air, but I have to say, Hey, that's a vibe I can really get behind right now. I needed that, honestly. Thanks. And this is like two weeks ago now, but don't worry, I'm going to just mention it really quick. Holly Lonsdale made her big announcement about the Mystery 10.2.6 Pirate Patch, which she finally revealed it would be staying a mystery, so f*** you. And don't get me wrong, this is very exciting. Possibly too exciting. Possibly building a bit too much hype for a 2.6 patch, which left unchecked to fester and brew for another month of no expectation lowering real news, might just reach a point where the actual 0.2.6 mini patch that happens can't possibly match the imagined 0.2.6 mega patch that the community has had time to imagine. But that's probably just me being paranoid since my ceiling collapsed. I'm sure that won't happen. When has anything like that ever happened? Yeah, see you in March, the pirate patch, I suppose. No, what I want to talk about today is World of Warcraft narrative director Steve Denuza and the news which he has since confirmed that after rumours first started circulating from his conspicuous absence at BlizzCon, we now know that he has left Team 2 and Blizzard as well. His LinkedIn profile having been updated to suggest that his employment with the company, confirmed by himself, ended in November last year, which would make it around the time of BlizzCon. Now, this might seem like strange news for me to want to talk about. After all, thousands of people were just laid off from Activision Blizzard far more recently than this, and I certainly don't want to speculate too much or go digging for drama on this, but I think our job as WoW creators is to talk about the game, but also to document the game to some degree too, and the narrative director leaving, especially one whose time in charge of the story was so controversial in so many ways, added to the fact that it kind of slipped under the radar for so long, added to the fact that we are looking at such a bold new direction and focus on story and how it's told with the World Soul Saga, added to the fact that I personally have known that Steve left the company for months and wanted to stay silent out of respect to him and my multiple sources within the company until it was more public knowledge, meaning that yes, actually, I absolutely am going to talk about Steve the Newser leaving the game. Because
because make no mistake, there will be large parts of the community that will be celebrating this news. Denuza was one of the most maligned and controversial narrative leads in the game's history, and many players will see the end of his leadership as a liberation and a vindication of their criticisms of his work. And honestly, fair enough. If you hated Steve and want to say so, that's absolutely your right and privilege as a consumer of online fantasy content. And this will be the perfect opportunity to do just that as we look back at some of the defining moments of Steve Denuza's WoW career. The burning of Teldrassil. This doesn't happen too much anymore but there was a point back in Battle for Azeroth where much of the hatred and bile directed towards Steve from the community was connected to the hatred that the community felt for the burning of Teldrassil's storyline that opened the expansion. Lots of people hated this as a narrative concept, lots more hated the execution of it and the corner it painted Sylvanas and the Horde into for just about the entire expansion afterwards. And like I say, there was a time when Steve got a a lot of that ire directed specifically towards him. So just for the sake of completion here, no, <laughs> obviously, that's silly. He had nothing to do with the burning of Teldrassil. As a simple look at his old LinkedIn will tell you, when that event was revealed to the public, so it had already been in development for months, God, maybe a year by then, Denuza was a humble quest designer, actually working on Legion quests, that terrible expansion that everyone hates. Steve was made a lead narrative director after Alex Afrasiabi was moved off the team and eventually campus for being a creepy abuser man. So in the grand scheme of the news a legacy criticism, it should be quite uncontroversial to call this unfair. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, whoa, Tally, is this whole section gonna be a defense of Steve Denuza? Is this what I'm watching right now? And no, no, it's uh, it's not, I promise. Two, the Nathanos self-insert. So, you might have heard this. Steve Denuza is a weird Sylvanas fanboy who wrote Nathanos as a self-insert so that he could romance her? or whatever. But this is like accepted fact. If you Google his name right now, it will not take you long to find people saying this about him. It being a topic that was repeated in some very successful videos from some much bigger creators than us. So basically any creator. And you must make up your own mind on this, of course, and how true it is. But first I would ask, is making self-inserts even a bad thing? If it is, then I hate to break this to you, but you are going to hate the new head of WoW story, Chris Metzen. Is this even what Steve actually did? This entire thing is mostly based on basically three tweets from 2018. One where he is stood in front of the Sylvanas statue at Blizzard with the tagline, the war chief is pretty insistent, I get back to work. One where he says, day three, I returned to Ogrimmar to report on my progress. I complimented the war chief on her crimson gaze and asked how my own eyes might achieve a similar glow. I found her reply, discomforting. And a tweet from when Wowhead data mined the new Nathanos model in the BFA data, which looks nothing like Denuza, <laughs> where he said, it's like looking into a dark mirror. Referencing, of course, the short story, Dark Mirror, that he wrote detailing how Nathanos got this new body, the body of his cousin. A dark mirror, of course, being a magical item which is supposed to reveal to the user secrets and hidden truths. And I mean, I'm just gonna be honest here, this is the flimsiest, most uncharitable, hating for the sake of it bullshit I have ever heard in my entire life. Like seriously, this self insert accusation was always bullshit. This was like a man being enthusiastic about story that he was in charge of writing. The kind of behavior we say we want and some of the shit that he's caught for these three tweets is absolutely wild and absolutely unfair criticism, but it does lead us into some much trickier areas. Three. Sylvanas. So, Steve was not in charge of the story when BFA was conceptualized and when the burning of Teldrassil and Sylvanas's part in it were decided on and set in motion, but he was in charge soon after that. So, all of the stuff that people hate about BFA, is that his fault? And this is a really tough one to call when you consider the now fairly well documented BFA's history. We've got an entire video that goes into this subject in a lot more detail, but first-hand accounts from inside the team at the time paint a picture 
of Alex Afrasiabi, the, the creepy abuser man, being dead set on the Sylvanus villain arc, which he started with Teldrassil and was due to end with her death at some point. This was an idea that wasn't particularly well planned out or popular in the team at large. And then when Afrasiabi was finally thrown out for his creepy abuser shit, the team were not just messed with that huge mess of a plot to sort out in BFA, but were also apparently told by Blizzard leadership that the planned endpoint, Sylvanus's death, was categorically not allowed to happen. She was just considered too valuable to the franchise monetarily. And so now they have this character on the most villain of villain arcs who they weren't allowed to kill. And honestly, if that's true, and it definitely is, then I'm overall pretty sympathetic to the job that the team managed. There's stuff that I really don't like. The fact that BFA ends with us still not knowing who she's working with being the biggest issue in BFA's story, in my opinion, and the lack of context given to her relationship with the Jailer in-game during Shadowlands, one of the main narrative problems in that expansion. But there are other things, the Loyalist and Sourfang Rebel Choice quests, the relationship between Sylvanas and Anduin in the Shadowlands cinematics, which I think they did did a good job on. And I also think that the ending that, that they managed to that arc with the trial of Sylvanas and her banishment to the moor, both in concept and execution was a way better resolution than they had any right to be given the circumstances. I think that's genuinely good. There's no denying though that this whole period is a bleak and not fondly remembered one in WoW lore. Like I say, you must make up your own mind. <sighs> For this one, I think I'm going to choose to be reasonably charitable and on the weight of evidence, give Steve the benefit of the doubt and say it probably wasn't his fault. It was a no win. In rugby, we call it a hospital pass. I'm going to let him off this one, but it does bring up another criticism. Four, story outside the game. This is one of those criticisms that Denuza is most singled out for. The habit of putting important story not in the game where everyone can see it, but in outside media, mostly novels. And this is of course something that WoW has always done, and I think the most egregious example is war crimes, where the whole reason and explanation for why Warlords of Draenor even happened was published exclusively in those pages. It's wild, it's like if you didn't read that book, then one day you just woke up in game, Garrosh has escaped, we all hate Rathian now, the Dark Portal has just opened, but it's a different color, and orcs from 30 years ago, and also an alternative it timeline were pouring through intent on domination. And I'm sorry, but if Wad's entire existence wasn't dumb enough from a story point of view anyway, to then not even explain it to 90% of players was insane. Now, as far as novels go, Denuza's reign never gets this bad. Shadows Rising is actually kind of the perfect pre-expansion novel. No important plot it hurts to miss, a fun romp with some characters you like. It's great. The Sylvanas novel though, not so much. Not only does this book give important context and explanation to in-game events that you otherwise wouldn't know, but also the entire thing came out a year too late. It explains Sylvanas' relationship with the Jailer and why she follows him a lot better than the game ever manages. Now, I think the why is explained in game two. I certainly understood her emotional justification. She pretty much just says it to Anduin in those cinematics that I like. The thing that we really miss in game is the details around how Sylvanas and the Jailer met or like any interaction between them really. There is none of it in game. It is all in the novel. It's not ideal. I'm gonna call that a fail for Denuza for sure. But those aren't the only out of game media that he worked on. Oh no, five. The Titan's point of view. You know, this might even go down as Steve's biggest legacy in terms of lore. The recontextualizing of the Chronicle books from omnipotent word of God to an account from the Titan's point of view. People are still outraged by this today, saying how it invalidates everything in those three books as being potentially fallible and I am sympathetic to that complaint. I genuinely am. You are not wrong if that's your opinion on Chronicle. Personally, my personal opinion on this personally is that 
it's better this way? For me, it's more interesting to have the account of the Titans actions by their watchers and indeed just by the historians of Azeroth be potentially questionable. If not wrong, then just seen from a certain bias and point of view. I just find that interesting. It gives us fun things like the Broker cosmology chart from the Shadowlands Grimoire, which appears to contradict the Chronicle version, but is actually the same chart seen from an opposite viewpoint. We go over that in one of my legit favourite videos that we have ever made. I just like it, and it appears to be the idea that the World Soul Saga is running with too, so it is a legacy that will impact the story for a generation after Steve has now left. I'd actually call that a low-key win from Denuser, but you might disagree. That's fair. Six. There was that time on Twitter when he said he liked the conclusion of Game of Thrones Season 8 and is therefore obviously a complete idiot who should not be trusted with any story anywhere. And like, okay, like really, who cares if he liked a TV show I think sucks? I've seen Twitter. I've seen you on Twitter. Some of you like some dog shit. Loads of you probably like Lost, and I'm not going to hold that against you, even though you are definitely wrong because Lost sucks. But I don't think you can't write a good story just because you like Lost. I just think lots of people like trash sometimes, and it's not a reflection on their life or their work beyond that. Seven Shadowlands. Just Shadowlands. Okay, so BFA wasn't really Steve's fault, according to me. What about the expansion after Shadowlands? People hate the lore in that expansion. I've got to be honest, I don't blame them for that either. There's stuff that I like, as I said before, but the lore in this expansion is a complete mess. No one seems to have a handle on it. I've said before that I think its biggest problem is that the Shadowlands probably shouldn't have been an expansion setting, because you then have to introduce way more visual and tonal variety to it than the Shadowlands should have had. Like, the Shadowlands, it's, it's, it's grey. There's ghosts in it. Do Revendreth and Maldraxxus and Bastion and Ardenweal look cool and have interesting characters? Yes. Should they have been a part of the very one note, it's just a bit grey with ghosts in Shadowlands? No, no, it's a conceptual fail, which... I don't think it's down to Steve. I'm fairly certain that was decided before he took the reins. But, ah, I do think there is stuff you absolutely can blame him for, like... The Jailer. Huge missed opportunity. Very boring bad guy. Unsatisfying. Unexplored. I don't care if the main focus was intended to be Anduin Sylvanas. We needed a lot more of an engaging antagonist than this. Zoval absolutely is something Steve would have had creative sway and decisions over. This is a big, big fail for him as far as I'm concerned. As is the mess of Shadowlands lore in general. Now, I'm willing to be quite forgiving with this expansion because, like... I don't know if you remember, there was a worldwide epidemic and they were still sorting out the Sylvanas mess. But I do think introducing so much reference and recontextualization to old Warcraft 3 lore was a mistake. You can do it well, but there was so much of it and people were always going to hate it. I actually love Arthas' final fate, but I know I'm in the minority there. I am not pissing on your Arthas body pillow, I promise. I think the most damning thing you can say is that you get the feeling Shadowlands is going to be referenced the absolute least out of any past expansion in future installments. Like, you feel they're just going to try and ignore most of it, and I don't blame them, honestly. Eight, Dragonflight. This is a tough one. Dragonflight has come in for some passionate criticism for its writing recently, and plenty of it, I think, is justified. But my main problem when it comes to Dragonflight's writing is on the level of... Sometimes I literally just don't like the words that have been written. And Steve was the narrative lead on Dragonflight. He pitched the concept of the expansion. Out of every game that we've been talking about here, Dragonflight is the one that from start to finish was his vision. And the buck stops with him. Steve will have ultimately okayed every single line in Dragonflight, which I think is clunky or cringe, and he deserves criticism for that, but ultimately, it's not his writing. I generally like the themes and story beats of Dragonflight, which you'd imagine are much more than narrative director's actual job. So I think I like his work on this expansion. Like, great example, okay? The dialogue in the Amirdrasil end cinematic is not good. We all know that. But the thing that's happening here, the aspects getting blessed by Amirdrasil, the actual story, 
that's cool. That's a good story beat. And if we blame him for the Jailer, as we should, then I guess we should probably credit him for the Primal Incarnates and Eridicron, who are great baddies. Generally, I think people really like the side stories in this expansion too. And if we can criticize him for badly written quests that he didn't write, which I think we should, then perhaps we should give him credit for good quests that he didn't write as well. And for being a lead that facilitates his team and creates an environment to flourish. I don't know. I feel like we're still a little bit close to this one and the picture will definitely become clearer in the coming years like it did with BFA and Shadowlands. But I'm going to tentatively say that for now, overall, despite the lost momentum in Act 2 and the lack of overall stakes, something I think will probably seem a bit less like a problem in future expansions when we see Dragonflight as, you know, when Eridicron started everything rolling. I'm going to say that overall, I think his work on Dragonflight is a success. You may disagree. That's fine too. This is all pretty subjective. I think I'm going to finish this analysis of his legacy with this. There's no doubt that Steve Nuzo came into the job at probably the most challenging point in WoW's history story-wise. I think he and the rest of the team absolutely nailed some aspects of that cleanup, badly misfired on others. And I guess I've got a bias because I've always liked Steve on a personal level. I feel like a lot of the attacks made on him were incredibly unfair and personal and not the kind of thing that we should encourage in any community of grown-ups whatsoever. Also, if it's true what I've heard that he wasn't treated very well by Blizzard at the end, I know he doesn't say that, but it's, it's something I've heard, then that also completely sucks because I'm sorry, he deserved better because any employee deserves better than to be dicked around by a multinational corporation. I'm I'm very excited about WoW's new narrative direction under Metzen and Terran Gregory, and the whole concept of the World Soul Saga just presses all my buttons. So I don't know, maybe that's put me in a good mood, but if we are summing up Steve's legacy, I'm going to choose to remember him as the guy who had to do a lot of firefighting over the course of four or five years. He was part of a team that undoubtedly righted the very off-course ship that was World of Warcraft and helped lay the foundations for, hopefully, more optimistic times to come. You know, if WoW recovers or even flourishes during the World Soul Saga, we are going to look back at Dragonflight as being probably the most important expansion in WoW's history. And yeah, obviously that comes from mechanics and instances and things as well, but it was Steve's thing. There's lots that happened under his watch that I think is dumb or bad or actually just kind of offensive, but I can say that about the absolute greats too, so whatever. I'm very glad this is finally all public and all the streamers can stop skirting around it when people bring it up in chat and we can all finally start looking forwards again because call me an old softy shill, but I'm really optimistic about what comes next. I was thinking, there's not really much point of a sofa bit anymore, is there? Because we have the podcast for all of that. It's true. I mean, I know we don't sit on the sofa for the podcast like we do here, like no. we are right now at this very moment sitting on the sofa though, like. It's true, and we spend two hours doing it. But it would be a shame to lose the sofa bit because, you know, the sofa's so comfy. Uh, yes. <laughs> but there was something special that you wanted to say today, wasn't there, on this particular episode? An announcement, perhaps. Yeah, could you? Well, now everyone thinks you're pregnant just because that's can like. Can I just say? <laughs> people think that every like every week, every week someone's like, "Well, I think I know what Evertel's going to talk about." Well, <laughs> jokes on you because it's never happening they, they, again. They usually say something. They usually say something like, "Wow." I think we all know that Evie's pregnant because she looks terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did a little poll uh, for our patrons recently. Thank you, patrons. There's lots of very useful feedback, specifically for patrons, but for the channel, uh, resoundingly, people were like, hey, uh, we'd like to see the weekly reset more regularly. <laughs> like, what about weekly? <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what? That's a fair point, which sounds like a joke, sounds like a meme, but the interesting, one of the really interesting responses that I found was like, look, we'd really appreciate uh, a, a weekly reset kind of like update every week even if there's basically nothing to talk about even if the episode is only like six minutes long yeah, or something like that just to kind of be the there yeah, yeah exactly and to be like okay this is what's going on sort of thing rather than the whole uh, kit and caboodle yeah. um, although we are getting back into the kit and caboodle now yeah, with our amazing green screen and the caboodle very happy with very that good. Um, yeah so so, but and that was a really interesting response that really made me think mm -hmm. and was like yeah okay so I took that on board and I I am giving you now, I've turned into an announcement for me. Yeah, I'm pregnant. Yeah, I'm um, 
<laughs> we decided that uh, from here on in to make a, a a a proper dedicated commitment to a weekly reset every week even if it is like just a, a kind of five minute update. Exactly. Thing. So even if it's like a dead news week, even if no one is playing the game, even if like nothing is happening of interest, we are still going to sit down in front of the camera and give an update. So you yeah. can count on that like every week something will come out of us. Weekly reset commitment. Commitment yeah. every week. I'm as committed to this as I am my marriage. And look, we're still here after six years. So hey, I'm obviously you know, doing okay there. Okay. I will do as well with the weekly reset. Weekly reset, of course, older than our marriage. Yes, yeah, true. We should older give it the care children. and love it's that it the deserves. original child <laughs> yeah. in this relationship. How is love, in the, in, love is in the air? Lo oh, I loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved love is in the air. I never do holidays. I just, I just, they've never appealed to me. Um, uh, but this one, for whatever reason, like I jumped in and I absolutely loved it. In part because I wanted to fill up my traveler's log and get the cool stuff, which happened like instantly. In part because the 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 holiday was great. It was really good. I loved zooming around and going like visiting old locations. I thought I thought it was a really good way of like bringing to life the world uh, in a way that Holly kind of was talking about in her in her announcement, like kind of re uh, reanimating bits that we haven't seen before. Um, I had a really good time and I loved it. And props to the writers for putting in uh, Valentine's, sorry, love is in the air quests that are not like couple focused, that are just like, you know what you need? Love yourself. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. no, actually like really, really good. I'm yeah. more tempted to kind of check out other holidays from now on in. Same, so, yeah. same. Looking forward to it, Holly. Thanks, Holly. Holidays. <laughs> oh! Oh! Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> if you like this video, don't thank us. Thank our patrons who still give their real still. life money to make all of our work yeah. happen. Patrons, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your amazing answers. Thank you for inspiring us. As you yeah, did seriously. with the Weekly Reset when we first conceived of it, you know, mm -hmm. like, Weekly Reset was named by our patrons. It was. If you didn't like it, downvote the shit out of it. And remember, my name is Holly Longdale. <laughs> it's about time she got taken down a peg or two. Never. Send her our hate. <laughs> and make hate, hate meant for us. No, never. An and if you've got anything nice to say her. about Holly, uh, right in the comments on our video down here. <laughs> Let's just do a little swap like Freaky Friday. <laughs> just for a little bit. I just want to be Holly Longdale just for one day. I just want to live are. that life. Yeah. And she can be me for a day. See, what, see how she likes that. <laughs> see how much she loves WoW at the end of that. <laughs>